Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Long Box Carpentry. I am Noel, and joining me again, we have J.D. DeMott. Hello. How you been, J.D.? I'm doing well. I'm ready to discuss some comics. Some specifically seasonal comics. Yes, a certain season. A season that happened a few months ago. (laughs) (laughs) Well, by the time you get this episode up, it'll probably be almost halfway to Halloween anyways. (laughs) Yes. As he mentioned, we're doing Halloween comics, of which there are a surprising amount. Yeah, I was really surprised. Like, there was only, what, four or so Thing comics, three or so, like, Escape from New York comics, but there's been a lot of Halloween stuff. Yeah, just a lot of interesting ones that have been kind of knocked out. We'll we'll get to some of the big ones in the next episode, but almost a decade, because these ones were in 2000. I think the last one that we're going to cover a couple episodes from now, because yes, we are breaking this into multiple episodes, is like 2008, 2009. Wow. That's like almost 10 years worth of comics. It's not like steady publishing of 10 years worth of comics. True. Still, quite a bit. It's interesting because you don't usually see many slasher comics. No. I think there was this series, Hack Slash. Mm -hmm. But that was putting a very comic booky spin on slashers. Right. And that's really the only thing that leaps to my mind. I'm sure there's been others. Yeah. I mean, like all the big franchises like Elm Street and Friday the 13th have had tie-ins too. Right. And like, there's definitely a series called Final Girls that I remember Antarctic Press did where readers could actually vote on who survives the next issue. Okay. That sounds like a stupid concept, but <laughs> yeah, it, because it's an ongoing serialized nature, I really think you can't really do a whole lot unless you do a twist on it like you do with Hackslash or something yeah. where the serial killer is one of the protagonists. It's vigilantes versus villains, and the villains are just slasher movie killers, so there's still a very vigilante superhero quality to it. Yeah. I mean, the closest I can think of would be maybe Tomb of Dracula from Marvel Comics. I mean, it's obviously not a slasher villain, but it's definitely a story about the monster, especially as that series went on. The Hunters kind of became almost a secondary tier of characters, and it really became about Dracula himself. And you have, like, the final girl who survives and starts fighting the bad guy. You had the Loomis character. Yeah. That's about the closest I can think of, but yeah, it's definitely not a genre that seems to allow itself easily to the comic book medium. And I wonder how much of that is just because you can't do certain things like you can in filmmaking in terms of, you know, as we kind of brought up in the thing, it can be hard to do suspense and draw out suspense. You don't have music, you don't have stings, you don't have any of that stuff to play with. Right. Which are such an inherent part of the genre. Horror in comics is just harder to do. I mean, there are some really great ones out there if you're willing to do some work to find them. Yeah, but I think slashers specifically are more always suspense-based. Right. Though even then, you know, I can understand, yeah, you can do the gimmicky killer, you can do the wild over-the-top kill scenes and all that stuff, but you can't really do suspense in the same way you can a movie. The closest I can think of is Lock and Key, which is a really great comic by Joe Hill. That one used suspense pretty well. It took its time. It also had like kind of a lot of aspects that I think were closer to almost like an adventure genre. So these first three issues that we are going to cover in just this episode were all published by Chaos Comics. Or I should say... It's Chaos! Chaos exclamation marks comics. Yes. Have you ever read any Chaos Comics before? I've never read them. I have memories of them, mainly because I read a lot of Wizard Magazine. Oh, God, Lady Death was everywhere in Wizard. <laughs> yeah. Most of what I remember of them was they published Evil Ernie and a whole lot of comics about big-breasted women posing in the front of their magazine, barely wearing anything. Yeah, they were definitely the home of the trashy R-rated bad girl pinups. It has its place, but <laughs> it's, never, it's never something that's really interested me after I turned 20. Yeah, it was definitely one of those things that, especially once the internet age hit and access to attractive women was not as difficult as it was in the 90s, I think that they probably went bankrupt about 2001, if I recall. They started in 1994 and ended in 2002. 
Okay. So yeah, not far off. Yeah. It was about that time that the idea of, oh, I'm going to be able to see a partially clothed woman. Wow. I can't wait to see that really lost its appeal about that time. So yeah. Yeah. It was very much of the nineties. And of course their big titles, Lady Death, Chastity, Purgatory, Mm. Bad Kitty. Mm. And yeah, Evil Ernie was like one of their few dudes. Yeah. That's about the only one I remember. That kind of intrigued me just because it was kind of... It was the crow for the 90s extreme hair metal generation. Yeah. And admittedly, I was never really into that stuff very much. I never picked up an issue, but it was like the only one that seemed like it was a little bit more fun rather than titillating as it seemed to be basically a zombie guy with a smiley face button or something. And then they also did a handful of tie-ins with not only Halloween, but The Omen, The Mummy, Suspiria, and a surprisingly long-running line of WWE comics. I think I remember some of those because that was about the time my brother was into wrestling. And I think I bought one or two issues for him. The company was pretty much entirely run by Brian Pulido, who also wrote most of the books for it. They went bankrupt in 2002. And then what happened was they were actually forced to sell off the rights to all their characters, especially Lady Death and Evil Ernie started bouncing around various studios and distributors. I know Dynamite had them for a while recently. Yeah, Cross Gen had Lady Death. And then what's interesting is Avatar Press, who is still around, they actually started just a couple years after Chaos, but around 2002 when Chaos collapsed, Brian Polito moved over to Avatar and basically turned Avatar into the home for trashy, R-rated, hyper-violent, sexy pinup girl art, Mm. (laughs) to the point where they even had a line called Threshold where it's actual hardcore porn comics featuring all of our stars. (laughs) Oh, God. I'm not saying that critically. I think, again, there's a market for it. There's room for it. I mean, the thing is, when it comes to like the exploitation angle of comics, I don't mind it being there. I think the problem was that it became the mainstream. Oh, yeah, especially in the 90s. The image era. The image era, one of the many companies that was started by Jim Shooter, Broadway Entertainment, I Mm -hmm. think basically looked like, okay, yeah, I'm a teenager and I even I know gravity doesn't work that way um, as far as her chest is concerned. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of that. Things are allowed to be fantastical. Things are allowed to be cheap and trashy and titillating. Yeah. But because that was the mainstream, it put the entire audience onto teenage boys and people who weren't into that stuff were edged out. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm glad that there are still companies where people can get that if they want it, like Avatar, like... Top Cow is a little better, but, you know, they're still pretty cheesecake. And who is it that does the Grimm's Fairy Tale comics? I don't recall. I'm fine with them existing, but I'm kind of glad that this is no longer, as you said, Wizard Magazine. This was like every page of Wizard Magazine. Mm -hmm. Oh, did they love Lady Death and Wizard. They had like their babes section of the magazine that was just like in retrospect. At the time, I kind of appreciate it because like I said, I was a teenager in the 90s and really didn't have access to the internet. But nowadays, it just feels gross. I still remember their how to draw section. And this week, Mark Silvestri tells us how to draw women. (laughs) Yeah. So anyways, Halloween. Halloween issue one was published in November of 2000, a little over two years after the release of H2O. And again, the next two issues of this, it's not really a mini series per se. It's like three connected one shots. We'll get into the titles of them as we go along. But yeah, it was this. The next one was published in April of 2001. And then the third was published in November 2001. So it was like over the course of one year, you got these three issues. Yeah. Reading through it, it seemed obvious even before I noticed the dates because there's a different artist every single time. Mm-hmm. The stories kind of feel standalone-ish. They feel connected. but They feel yeah. connected, but there's a cliffhanger on issue one and issue two. But at the same time, they don't really feel like this is a continuation of that same story. I think they're kind of modeling it like a trilogy mm-hmm. as opposed to a three-issue miniseries. And it's interesting how it is one story, but it's not told as one story. It's told as three stories that kind of all just follow each other. Right. Because, I mean, if you look at the trade dress, it says Halloween 2, number one. Halloween 3, number one. Yeah. The, yeah, they're meant to stand on their own. But like you said, they're tell a connected story. In our Curse of Michael Myers episode, we got into the career of screenwriter Daniel Ferrans. He was the one who wrote the original draft that then got completely redone. And he's since been like producing those, you know, massive making of documentaries for the entire horror franchises. I'm not sure if he did any scripting for this issue or just co-plotted. I even listened to a podcast interview with Philip Nutman just a few minutes ago where he's very deaf and can't understand what the question is. So he just keeps talking. (laughs) It was an awkward episode. 
the two of them were friends and collaborated on a number of screenplays, Philip Nutman and Daniel Ferrans. Nutman, I just went out, he got his big break in 1985 when he began contributing articles to Fangoria magazine. Because living in the UK, he actually had a lot of connection to a lot of British horror films that were being made over there, and actually then became friends with Clive Barker and a number of stuff. So he continued to contribute to Fangoria for like 34 years, even throughout his entire career. And he was good because he was in the industry, he could actually interview people in the industry pretty easily. He was also an early member of the splatterpunk movement that rose out of the 80s. I don't know if you, you ever <laughs> got into much of the splatterpunk movement. No, but I've heard of it. That's what early Clive Barker was and John Shirley right. and John Skip and Craig Spector and all that stuff. I mean, I've seen some Clive Barker and his movies and stuff, but I've never dived too deep into that well. Hellraiser is very much coming out of the splatterpunk movement. Yeah. It was fans of like the Sex Pistols and fans of horror saying, hey, what if we did punk horror? So it's just everything is a little more extreme. Yeah. Which fits a company that has an exclamation mark in its title. <laughs> oh, yes. So anyways, he wrote a bunch of short stories leading up to his first novel, Wet Work, being published in 1993, and it was actually a pretty modest success and got him a lot of friends. And around that time, he was also trying to break into comics. Surprisingly, after some fill-in comics for Archie... Oh, that seems like a natural jump. Yeah, like he did some Ninja Turtles, he did a couple other things. And this was their Ninja Turtles, not the darker Ninja Turtles. Right. And he did some work for Defiant, speaking of Jim Shooter. <laughs> Nutman ultimately settled in as a regular at Chaos, spending several years as the primary writer of Evil Ernie and Chastity, as well as doing their tie-in comics for The Omen and Suspiria. And this Halloween trilogy is his last real work in comics, and he never really did much else after the collapse of chaos. But he and Franz kept working together on a number of scripts that, you know, some got made, some didn't. Most prominently, they co-wrote the film adaptation of Jack Ketchum's The Girl Next Door. Very dark story. I haven't seen it yet. Hmm. In recent years, Nutman continued to publish short stories, many of which he finally collected in Cities of Night, though sadly he passed away in 2013 at the age of 50. Oh, that's a shame. And yeah, as you mentioned, he wrote all three of these issues, but he has different collaborators on each one. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of fits with how each one kind of has a different focus. But it should be well, he was the primary scripter. He had other people kind of working out the story beats with him, but he did pretty much all the writing himself. So getting his start on a fill-in issue for the triumphant comic series Scavengers. I don't remember triumphant comics. I think I've seen something about them, but I have no memory of what it was. I'm guessing the company wasn't very triumphant. Uh. David Brewer quickly, <laughs> quickly found his way to Marvel, where he spent over a decade penciling sporadic villain issues for Cable, Doctor Strange, Incredible Hulk, and Deadpool. He also did a couple issues for DC and started off Extreme Youngblood with its first issue. Because <sighs> that's when you want to stick around beyond the first issue. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Youngblood wasn't extreme enough. We had to have an extreme Youngblood. Extreme. From Extreme Studios. Yeah. <laughs> God, Extreme Studios. Yeah. So he was most prominently, he was an artist for Chaos with runs on Evil Ernie, Lady Demon, Dead King. I I'd love to dead. see what the story is behind that Dead King. Well, he's dead, so... Um, Issue's over. Yeah. <laughs> issue zero. Page one. Dead. And seemed to become noted for just doing first issues on a lot of other books like Vandala, Static X, and Halloween. And beyond a Deadpool core issue in 2010, he doesn't have any credits following the collapse of chaos in 2002, and I'm not really sure what he's been up to since. Hmm. Finally, after getting a start on a few of the Marvel Image crossover books of 1997, inker Curtis Arnold quickly found his way to chaos, where he became one of their most prominent and prolific inkers, working on many of the things I've mentioned so far. Again, his work became very sporadic after the collapse in 2002, though he did do a good handful of work for Dark Horse on issues of Buffy, Angel, Star Wars, and BPRD. Hmm. It's interesting that Chaos did seem to always have these house teams. It was very much a core group of people who would do a lot of their stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, because I looked up the artists on the next two issues following, and it seems like a lot of them are very much house artists, mm -hmm. which nothing wrong with that. But only I think one of them really had a huge career outside of Chaos. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into that. And then following the collapse of Chaos, a lot of them seem to really struggle to get work. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of surprised that given how much Polito, when he went to Avatar, basically reshaped it into the new Chaos how most of these people didn't follow. But then again, I know that he outsourced a lot of his art at Avatar to foreign artists and like Filipino artists and, and a number of other people overseas just to get it cheaper. Yeah. You just can't afford to pay the rates that most artists would expect nowadays. Yeah. Anything you want to add before I jump into the synopsis issue one? No, just do it. All right. 
Set some time after the events of Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers, we pick up with Tommy Doyle as he's banging out notes for a book about Michael and Dr. Loomis. The day before Halloween, Tommy's managed to score an archive of Loomis's notes from Michael Cyphers, the county records clerk. Michael, of course, shows up and kills Cyphers before Tommy gets there, and neither he nor the guard see Cyphers nailed to the back of his office door with a knife in his throat as the records are gathered up. Pouring through the notes, Tommy learns about Michael's life as a child at Smith's Grove Sanitarium, where he was housed in a dorm with other troubled boys who gradually succumbed to tragic fates. Tony O'Malley, the vicious bully, took a crayon to the eye after trying to rough up Michael and was eventually locked away in a padded cell. Adrian, a compulsive eater, is boiled alive in a shower after eating Michael's eighth birthday cake. Roger, a biblical-quoting masochist, bit off his own tongue and choked to death. There's also a kid named Blair who also killed his sister, but he doesn't appear again. I wonder if he'll be important later. Spoilers, he won't. <laughs> I don't know why they even introduced him. I don't know. It's like the writer was like, oh, hey, I have the opportunity to use the word Negro at least once. Yeah, I had that in my notes. That felt weird. And it's not a character that we never see again. I mean, it was from Loomis's notes. Loomis's POV in the late 60s. But yeah, yeah I was going to say, it's not necessarily out of character, right. but it still feels really odd, especially for a comic that was written in like early 2000s. Yeah. So. And also that it's used for a character that they're setting up that has also, like Michael, he also killed his own sister and will never pay that off ever. Right. No, I don't have any clue as to what was going on there. So moving on. Throughout all this, Loomis is quick to realize Michael is behind the killings and is fully aware of himself and his surroundings despite his silent vegetative appearance. Loomis gradually wins the support of Jennifer Hill, a fellow psychiatrist, but neither are able to prove their case to Dr. Carpenter. Oh, that's clever. The sanitarium's director. <laughs> I see what you did there! Hill and Carpenter. Mm -hmm. And Cyphers. The sanitarium's director, who sees Michael as helpless even when a girl drowns in the middle of a Halloween party after beating Michael in a game of musical chairs. Despite the stress and Loomis's increasing obsession, a romance builds between he and Jennifer to the point where rings are exchanged. Loomis is all set to leave the case behind when, one night, Jennifer follows Michael down a hallway, only to be found by Loomis on the grounds outside where her broken body fell from the roof. Back in the present, Tommy is taking a booze break away from the notes when he's suddenly attacked by Michael. Tommy wards off death by setting the killer's head on fire with the undrunken booze, and Michael disappears into the night with Tommy vowing to hunt him down and kill him. So, do you recommend issue one? Uh, not really. Compared to a lot of the comics that we've discussed, these Carpenter books, it's not bad, but it feels like a retread of what Rob Zombie would do later on. And admittedly, this came first. It's a predecessor. Especially since I saw Rob Zombie's first, it feels like a lot of the same notes and doesn't seem to add anything to the mythos. Like, I always was kind of intrigued by what happened between Loomis and Michael as a young boy as he grew up. And this is not what I wanted to see any more than what I wanted to see in Rob Zombie's film. There are parts that are kind of interesting, but I didn't need to have Loomis have a fiancé that was killed by Michael <laughs> or implied this killed by Michael. We never see it. Yeah. Oh, no, I gotta do that probably. This time, it's personal. <laughs> ah, evil. 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 <laughs> but there are other parts of these three parts that I like better. And, th and this isn't bad. If you're looking for Halloween things, you could do a lot worse. You know, you could watch Halloween 8 again. <laughs> Sorry, I just watched that last night for the first time, and that film can go die in a fire. <clears throat> um, Saving my thoughts for a future episode. <laughs> yeah. I can't really strongly recommend it. It's not terrible, but it's not great. It's one of those ones where it's like, I don't recommend it, but I also don't not recommend it. I think it's one of those yeah. things, if you're a Halloween fan and are curious about some Halloween comics, it's not entirely necessary to check out, but it's also not something that's entirely a waste of time if you do. Because I do think it's an interesting story. My main problem with the Rob Zombie one is the whole characterization of Michael just didn't fit classic Michael. So the whole story just kind of felt nonsensical to me. Yeah. Here, I will say, I actually think the character of Michael fits what they're doing with it. I kind of like that he's just the silent kid that they keep trying to bring out of a shell. That there are these other kids at the asylum who have their own issues. And they keep clashing and Michael is already starting his spree and his kind of pettiness and his display. And, you know, and he's kind of quietly doing it in a way where no one believes Loomis, even though Loomis comes off like the boy who cried wolf, even though he's right. Yeah. I like some of this backstory. I like some of how it's presented. There's some bits that aren't needed. 
the whole Tommy Doyle framing story doesn't quite work, but I don't dislike this actually as an issue. I don't know if I don't dislike it enough to recommend it. Yeah, that's kind of where I land is that it's not terrible. It's just... It's teetering on that middle ground for me. Yeah, it's just there's nothing really that I feel strongly enough about that I can say, yeah, you should probably check this one out or no, avoid it. It's just there. You brought up Loomis's fiance. I kind of like the romance that builds there, but the payoff, again, just feels like we need to explain why Loomis is so obsessed with Michael. Yeah. Even though it's just always been Loomis is obsessed with Michael. (laughs) Right. I don't know. It just seems weird to me that in six films, well, five technically, but five films, he never mentions, oh yeah, by the way, I'm pretty sure he killed my fiance. It doesn't fit. It's there to get an emotional reaction out of us, but it doesn't fit with the world that we've seen. I mean, I know there is in the first film a deleted scene where he calls his wife, Mm. but again, they cut it explicitly because they were like, this character doesn't quite work as a married man. Yeah, didn't you say that that was something that Donald Pleasance had requested. Oh, I can't remember. It's been so long since I've recorded that episode. I listened to the episode recently, but I think, yeah, I think I remember that you said that that was a, something Donald Pleasance requested. That was like in our first year of a three-year show. <laughs> <laughs> and you didn't take extensive notes that still are ongoing today? Jeez. No, because I could just re-listen to the episode, which I didn't. <laughs> I agree. I think it shows that he's always been obsessed with Michael and he really wouldn't have time in his life for anything else. Especially at this point. What I do like is the build of the romance because I like that while she is there as a draw to get Loomis away from Michael to be, you know, you have two forks in the road here. You go down the Michael path or you go down her path. She's still very supportive of him and she's actually got his back in terms of the stuff with Michael. She agrees with him on the stuff with Michael. So she's not like, why don't you just leave this alone and come be with me? It's more just she sees how far down into it he's going and is trying to keep him from falling into it farther than he already is. Even though she's being there for him and supporting him in it. I like that character wise. But then the whole twist there, it's like, if she knows what's going on with Michael, why would she go down a lonely hallway where she sees Michael? Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of like little things like that. Like, why did you do this? It just doesn't make sense within the context of the story. Like, director Carpenter, which, yeah. Or as it's said in one panel, Carpenter. Yeah. There's a lot of little errors in this comics that I've noticed. I saw one where four is F-R-O. Yeah. Ah, indie comics. Yeah. Well, like, it's whatever. They had to make sure nipples weren't showing. They were busy. <laughs> But yeah, Director Carpenter, he seems like so adamant to that, no, this child is just a normal child. And like after so many accidents that happen within a year of Michael being there, that doesn't make sense to me. Okay, once I can see you kind of riding off, but by the the third time, yeah, yeah, you, you need to put that kid under lock and key until you figure out what the heck's going on. At the very least, just to see if that affects the situation at all. Yeah. Yeah, and again, like her dying... It added a motivation to Loomis that we didn't need. Let's talk about some of the other kids who died. Like, yeah, the one bully who wants to beat up the new kid and gets stabbed in the eye with a crayon and then gets locked in a padded cell. Which does get blamed on the other kid, the one with the glasses, Mm -hmm. rather than Michael, but... I don't know. It just feels kind of petty for a lot of the things that Michael decides. Like, I don't know why he'd be upset about... Like, I could see, like, him attacking the one that bullied him. Right. But I don't know why then he would talk the kid with glasses into biting off his tongue and choking on it. Well, and that's the thing is we don't know. That one is just told to us. Like, we don't even get, like, a scene of that. Do you think that might be a case of Loomis just kind of presuming? I'm taking it as was probably Michael, but it's just the fact that I just don't understand, like, how Michael could have done that to a kid when he doesn't talk. And so unless he had cut off the tongue and made it look like a biting and made him swallow it and make him choke on it, I don't know how you do that. If they hadn't done the bit it off and just had it be that he choked on his tongue, it'd be believable that Michael just pushed it in. Right. There's a lot of little things that just don't quite add up completely. It's a horror thing. I mean, there's a lot of like in the film, Michael stabs people through the chest and pins them to the cupboard. It's not exactly a realistic take on things. But at the same time, if you're going to set up things like that, that wouldn't be that hard to fix it. But what I like is that Michael, well, a lot of the reasons are bad. Like, I actually like that he got back the kid who stole his birthday cake, because come on. I think that's a little <laughs> petty for Michael. Like, Not to say that Michael can't be petty, but it's just like, I don't think he really cares about cake. No, he doesn't care about the cake, but he cares about the fact that that was his. 
Michael is someone who doesn't need much to have him target a person. True. Especially in the later movies where he just killed everybody. Yeah, that's true. And this is definitely in the continuity of all one through six. I mean, like the girl who beats him at musical chairs and says he has cooties, you know? Mm -hmm. But what I like about it is that he's not going over the top about it. He's giving himself alibis and plausible deniability and setting it up so that it's so not obviously him, even though it's obviously him. Right, which fits the first film, because that was the thing, is the later films, he just became unstoppable killer. Terminator, yeah. Yeah, but in the first film, he would take his time, he'd wait for opportunities. You get the impression that this is very much in that model, and I do like that part. And he has a bit of whimsy to it, that he likes to do killings that actually kind of have a little more meaning to it, or he also loves his displays. Yeah, that was one thing, having rewatched all the films, or watched some of the films for the first time, was that the early films, they'd have those displays, especially the first one, and they kind of got away from that. That's kind of a shame. I still think one of the only things Part 5 did right was bringing that back. Yeah. And then I also like that Michael is still just sitting there, stone-faced, glassy-eyed, so unassuming. Yeah, and it seems to fit with what we saw, like the Michael in, you know, we only got like 10 seconds of him at most in that first film. We even did have, in like part two, you had, Laurie has those flashbacks where she remembers meeting Michael in the asylum, and it's just the blonde kid who turns and looks at her. And again, when they did that extended cut of Halloween, they had a few extra scenes set back in the day between Loomis and Michael. See, I've not seen those, and I kind of wish that they had included that on the DVD that I got from Netflix. See, the Blu-ray that I have has the whole branching thing where you can watch three different cuts. Oh, that's cool. But yeah, one of the things that kind of bugged me the most, though, was the fact that the only interaction between Loomis and Michael is Loomis going, You did this! You did it! You're evil! And I know the Rob Zombie film has a lot of faults, and I will not defend it too earnestly. I think it is a film that has its plus and minuses, but I think one of the things it did really well, and admittedly, I don't know if it fits the Halloween franchise, but one thing I think it did really well was instead of just having Michael just snap and become this evil monster, it showed him spiraling. And that was something I found fascinating. And unfortunately, because they're following what has kind of been established in this franchise, the original films, he's just turned off and is just a monster. And I really think that if you're going to go flash back to this, they need to at least show like Loomis trying as he grows more desperate as opposed to like him just being convinced that this kid is just evil from the get-go. And basically, like you said, the only real dilemma he has is whether or not he wants to continue to have Michael as a patient or go off into the sunset with Dr. Hill. I'm even looking in the comic right now and he has one page where it's setting up him talking to Michael and it's draw whatever you like, Michael. And Michael, of course, draws the picture of killing the family. And it ends with literally, of course, he didn't speak. What I was searching for was right in front of my eyes. And like from then on, Michael's a killer. He's a monster. We got to lock him up evil. (laughs) And again, most of it is we just have the narration recounting all these other things that happened with the other kids. You have so much Loomis talking to Jennifer. Yeah. But yeah, no, you don't get much of Loomis talking to Michael. Even in a few bits where you see Loomis talking to Michael, it's just we hear narration. Yeah. And I think it's that when I realized that oh, this is kind of the origin of the relationship between Michael and Loomis. And it really isn't there. It's showing them interacting, but it's not really explaining anything that we didn't already know. And I think that's one of the biggest disappointments I had with this story is that it's really just kind of what you'd expect with very little that it adds to the mythos. Anything else you want to say about the backstory or is it okay to jump to the framing story? Yeah, let's just jump to the framing story. Yeah, where... Tommy. I did not expect that we would get the further adventures of Tommy Doyle. And we don't. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, sort of, but what I think you had mentioned to me before that this was co-written by Franz, who you know did Halloween 6, so mm-hmm. it kind of made sense in that sense. And so I I wasn't super shocked, and I will say it does look like Paul Rudd. At times. At times. I don't think they legally had his likeness. Right. But it's close enough that you could tell who it's supposed to be if you've seen that movie. Yeah. Generic dude, a little creepy. Or if you know that Paul Rudd was in that film. But yeah, it really isn't much of a story, though. It's kind of setting up things that we'll see in the next couple issues. Because, yeah, a lot of it is just getting the Loomis notes and then reading the Loomis notes and... Let's kill off the person who gave him the Loomis notes. And of course, then we have to repeat the whole killing of the sister. And I do like the final confrontation where Michael comes in and tries to kill the Paul Rudd character. 
And Paul Rudd is ready for him. Yeah. He has the gun. He lights Michael's head on fire. There's actually some really nice bits of the art where you see the mask melting. Yeah. We really didn't discuss the art very much, but the art is actually not bad. I mean, it's not the best I've seen. No. But it definitely serves the story. I mean, it's kind of that 90s style of kind of extreme at certain points. I wouldn't go so far as to say extreme, but it had that thing in the 90s where it was okay to be a little cartoony. Yeah. You know, there was a little bit of that manga in influence, especially in terms of like the eyes and the hair and stuff. Right. Well, I'm just looking at the scene where he stabs Michael Cyphers, which, by the way, yeah. is a terrible name to use in a comic where the antagonist is called Michael Myers and you're going to have Michael Cyphers. It took me a second until I realized like almost half the names are like shout outs to the actors yeah. and crew of the first film. But I was like, wait, why is he called Cyphers? Is that is this some sort of like clue? Is this guy related to Michael? What's going on here? Because I thought it was too close to Michael Myers, but it's just a weird little shout out. Yeah, they shouldn't have called him Michael, like Bob Cyphers or something like that. Yeah. The panel where he gets stabbed, it's pretty grotesque. The blood's coming out of the neck. He got the screaming face. Yeah, it's... I've seen worse, but it's definitely playing it up. Oh, yeah. Well, this was where you could get away with R-rated violence in the comic, but you still can show boobs. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, like, you see the kid with the pencil in his eye. You see the kid boiling in the shower. You see Jennifer on the ground with her head twisted around. It's going to show the violence, but I at least like that it doesn't linger on it more than it needs to. Mm -hmm. It's like you get a panel and then, you know, you jump away to other things, which is what I actually like in slasher movies. It's fine if you're going to do a gimmicky over-the-top kill, but just don't hang on it too much. Right. Like blowing up the dad's head in Halloween 6, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah the art is fine it's a little clunky around the edges yeah. but it's fine the characters aren't bad again i like that he really captures the glassy-eyed michael you know loomis looks like loomis he does a good mm -hmm. wide-eyed craze for some of the other kids in the asylum and i don't know i like it yeah no it, it works it's not spectacular art but it's perfectly fine no but having gone through some of these carpenter comics that we've done this is actually not necessarily near the top but it's definitely better than a lot of them Still not as good as the Snake Plissken Chronicles. <laughs> if you say so. Ass pole. <laughs> oh, damn you, No, <laughs> I had forgotten that. I'm never going to let you. Anyways, moving on. The framing story is just that. It's just like setting up Tommy looking through the diaries and then Michael attacking. Or is it Michael? We'll get to that later. And then being thrown out the window and then he's like, I'm going to find you and kill you. Because tough guy Paul Rudd is definitely what we're looking forward to in the next issue. Again, yeah, they serve their purpose. I kind of like that, as we said, each issue is kind of its own story. I like that the first two issues are, here are stories that the characters are learning. It's more backstory and that they have mm -hmm. the framing device. And then the third is about paying off that framing device. I'm fine with it. Yeah, I mean, it, you don't actually get much of the Tommy Doyle character. You never find out what happened to the woman and the kid from the part six that he was in love with. You never find out anything else. He's not doing his wonderful 8-bit computer programs. <laughs> You don't have your Thorn screensaver? He doesn't care to capture the performance of Paul Rudd, where it's just like, yes, I have the notes of Dr. Loomis, I'm going to write a book. <laughs> like some of the early panels, when he's like looking through the thing, he kind of looks like that creepy, like when he's getting the diaries from Cypher's office, mm -hmm. but he looks like the creepy Paul Rudd. That's right, where he's like holding up those, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's just the artist just going, yeah, this guy should have at least a little touch of that creepy thing that he did in six. But then by the end of the story, I think it's written pretty much as kind of the leading man that we saw in the theatrical cut of Halloween six. And not to get into what's going to happen in the next two issues yet. One thing that I, I will say is they do not make him the new Loomis like they were intending to in part six. No. Anything else you want to add on issue one? No, I think we've covered it. All right, let's jump to issue two, which again is Halloween 2, issue one, titled <laughs> The Blackest Eyes, which I kind of like that motif that they do with the using the eyes quote. Yeah. It's again co-written by Philip Nutman. His co-writer this time is Mickey Yablons, the son of Erwin Yablons, who executive produced the first three Halloween films, as well as films like Tourist Trap, Roller Boogie, Hell Night, Prison, and Arena, before giving up and retiring from the film industry. Mickey hasn't produced anything outside of 2004's Real Spring Break Uncensored. Okay. And mostly has a career of bit part cameos in his father's films, including the original Halloween where he played the bully Richie. Oh, really? Which explains a bit that we're about to get into. Okay. <laughs> 
And I can't tell if it's the same guy or not, but there's a Mickey Yablons who looks just like him, who's currently a financial advisor for Wells Fargo in California. So he may have just gone outside the film industry. I found a LinkedIn profile. (laughs) It might be. But again, it was still primarily written by Philip Nutner. Penciler Jerry Beck got his start in 1995 as the writer and artist of Grimlock for Empire Comics, neither of which I've heard of. I think I've heard of Grimlock, but I don't remember anything about it. I know the one that led the Dinobots. Well, yes. I don't think it was about that, but I could be wrong. Me and comics, they extreme. (laughs) You made me snort. (laughs) So he bounced around with freelance work at a number of indie publishers, most prominently drawing a series called Arizona and a crossover series between The Crow and Razor. I completely forgot about the 90s character of Razor. <laughs> she apparently had like 60 issues of comics. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I think I remember seeing it like again, probably it was She more... was like a knockoff of Psylocke. Yeah, but I don't remember anything about her. Yeah, let alone that there was a full miniseries crossing over her and The Crow. Right. I kind of always thought the crow was one of those things that the creator was had a little bit more integrity, I guess, or something. I mean, I know there have been some other crow like miniseries and one shots, but not that many. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't think it's not one of those things that got oversaturated, definitely, compared to some of the stuff. Well, the film sequels, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, we don't talk about those. So, anyways, in 1999, he again found a home at Chaos, where he drew a number of their WWE wrestling books, had a surprisingly long run of insane clown posse comics. Ugh. Yeah, seriously, the insane clown posse comic ran for like two years. Let me just moan once some more in disgust. Ugh. Well, if you're going to find a home for insane clown posse, it's going to be Chaos Comics. And now that they're defunct, we should keep them there. His work since the collapse of Chaos has again been sporadic, but he's done a number of anthology shorts. He did a creator-owned miniseries at Image called Something Wicked, and just recently self-published a new comic called How to Draw Monsters, where he also explored what it's been like growing up as a comic artist with autism. Hmm. Very cool. And I've even looked at his prints, his art style. We'll get into his art style, but his art style hasn't changed much, and he's still selling, like, prints and all that type of stuff on his website. So Inker Chance Wolf got his start in 1991 at Ripoff Press with his own indie series, The Magical Nymphini. I can't imagine why he got work at Chaos Comics. The covers are exactly what you imagine they are. (laughs) He quickly joined Image, where he became a regular inker and occasional fill-in penciler on Shadowhawk, Pitt, and Angela, and most prominently Spawn, which he was the inker on for well over a decade. Hmm. And the other inker, because there's two on this one, Sandu Floria has been a hugely prominent inker and occasional penciler since debuting in 1992 with an issue of Savage Sword of Conan. And since then, his credits are impossible to sum up with multiple books every month, not only out of both of the big two, but various indie companies, and currently works on a handful of the DC books. And literally, like, his credits page just went on and on. (laughs) Incredibly prolific anchor. So anything you want to mention about the crew before I jump into the synopsis? Only that Chance Wolf has the second best name since Dick Warlock. And he would often go by the nickname Sea Wolf. (laughs) S E E C Wolf. I see what he did there. Yeah. Figuring Michael is still vulnerable following his near escape, Tommy decides to track him to the old Myers home. Unfortunately, the old school bullies who picked on him in the first movie, Richie, Lonnie, and Keith, are still in town. Lonnie and Keith are drug dealers who decide it would be fun to sideswipe Tommy's car for no reason, then back off with insults when he pulls a gun on them. Richie is a drunkard sitting outside the Myers house, stewing over when he ran into Michael as a child. Richie breaks in with cans of gasoline, intending to burn the place down, but he's stabbed to death by a figure in the shadows. Shockingly, the figure isn't Michael, but the old retired Sheriff Lee Brackett, speaking of Charles Cyphers, mm-hmm. whose daughter Annie was killed in the first film. Realizing his mistake, Brackett tosses the body in his trunk and dries out to a pumpkin patch. Tommy sees this and follows, and when he confronts Brackett, we learn a backstory that's trying even harder than the Cult of the Thorn in Part (laughs) 6. Yeah. Haddonfield derives from Hayden, the druid word for cursed, and the town was initially settled by druidic immigrants led by Murphy Myers, who was under a curse where every generation of his bloodline would produce a soulless child of a killer. To try to appease the gods, they started to ritually sacrifice criminals and the mentally ill on staked pyres, and this worked until 1957. Michael was born just before midnight on Halloween. 
He was stillborn and about to be tossed in an incinerator when he suddenly started to breathe a few minutes later on the Day of the Dead, November 1st. What this presumably means is he was born before his soul actually entered his body, thus enacting the curse. Catching us up to the timeline of the first film, we learn Michael initially showed no outward displays of being a monster of this curse, but that his father abused his sister Judith Myers in ways which made her a nymphomaniac as she slept with almost every guy in high school, including a then-teenage Sheriff Lee Brackett. It was her murder that actually led him to become a cop because he's so noble. Mm -hmm. Back in the present, Lonnie and Keith are killed by Michael when they search the Myers house for Richie, and in the pumpkin patch, Brackett reveals to Tommy that he possesses a secret diary written by Dr. Loomis. They're suddenly attacked by figures in black robes who never call themselves the Cult of the Thorn, but are led by Mrs. Blankenship, the old lady from Halloween 6. The cult takes the pair to the old church, intending to sacrifice them to Sam Hain, but the town priest is no longer interested in being a part of the cult. He sets the two free only for Michael, fresh from killing some costumed teenagers so he can get a new mask, kills the priest, and stabs Brackett. Tommy again, again, sets Michael's head on fire. That's like the equivalent of kicking Michael in the crotch. you got to set his head on fire. <laughs> it's the only thing that'll stun him for a second. Yeah, it, it resets him. It makes his eyes tear up a bit, you know, and then they turn into steam. And then he's <laughs> angry again. He'll kill you. But that's Michael. And then knocks him into a fuse box, electrocuting the killer, though his head does not blow up this time. Darn. Tommy drags the sheriff out of the church as it burns, but he's again ambushed by the cult. And we cut to three months later where we see Tommy locked in a cell where he was convicted of the latest round of killings. JD, what did you think of the developments of this issue? Um, I am a little bit conflicted. There are parts of this that I think are actually a little bit more thrilling than what we got last time. I think in some ways it's a faster read. <laughs> Well, it went by quicker. <laughs> but I did not need the backstory. The backstory was, like you said, it's Halloween 6 all over again. It's trying to explain this thing that works better when you don't explain it. Because it's never satisfying when you're this far into a series and trying to explain why something that has been purposefully left unexplained, it just doesn't work. I give it a week, not recommend, but there are parts that I think are kind of entertaining as far as like <laughs> it could fit into a middling sequel if this had been fleshed out into its own story. As you point out in that podcast interview I listened to, Philip Nubbin says that Daniel Franz, in prep for this, did actually send him a copy of that full producer's cut of Halloween 6. So he mm -hmm. did get to see all the backstory that was cut, even though this doesn't really tie into that at all. I actually don't recommend this one because it, again, falls into the same trap of following six of it's one thing to try to explain something. It's another to just come up with such a convoluted series of things that don't fit together, even though you think they do. It's where you're trying to be so clever that you don't realize that you're literally just digging yourself a hole even deeper and deeper. Yeah. I will say I did like the revelation of Haddonfield was originally Hayden. I actually looked up the etymology of Hayden, and it actually does go back. Hayden was Hayden, which was a slang for heathen. Mm. I mean, it doesn't mean cursed, like they're trying to say in this comic, but it's something that you could actually see, like, if that was what the intention was, that's actually kind of clever. So, yes, that was one clever word balloon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> The rest of the stuff, I just was like, hey, it's a big, huge info dump. Because that's what it comes across, as opposed to like the one where the main story was just really the backstory. I mean, it was a flashback, but it was still telling a story within it. Right. This isn't really a story as much as it is just, here's everything that led up to Michael Myers' birth. Did we really need that? Plus, like you said, it seems to be avoiding certain things like naming the Cult of the Thorns, which I don't know why, considering it seems very obvious. I don't think they were actually named the Cult of the Thorn in the theatrical cut of Six. Mm. That might be why. Because if you look at Halloween 6, the theatrical cut, they did drop a lot of the backs. But th you know, that was, again, one of the things that we liked about the theatrical cut, me and Alex, was that mm -hmm. it drops this whole thing of Michael being tied to this ancient cult and instead turned it into this cult was already an existing thing that then found Michael and then kind of centered themselves on him. Right. Whereas this feels like it's trying to go right back to that producer's cut thing of, no, Michael has this deeper history and it's trying to do its own version of that, where he's the mm -hmm. descendant of Murphy Myers. Yeah. 
dead or alive, you're all coming with me. <laughs> God. Um, but we never find out the backstory of how he got cursed, just that he is. That, you know, every generation, a slayer will be born. <laughs> He was like, I'm going to steal this Stonehenge slab, and then we're going to move to... No. I would not have been surprised had they worked in Silver Shamrock, too. I'm surprised no Halloween sequel has ever worked in Silver Shamrock. They have opportunities to. It would be hard to like justify it considering the end of that film, but... I mean, you could do it, but it would require a little bit more explanation than I think they're probably willing to get into it. Oh, yeah. I have some ideas, but they would basically be Halloween 6. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Michael stops being interesting when you just have it be that he's just another tool of this broader cult. Mm -hmm. You know, he's just another stage of this curse that goes on generation after generation. It's like, no, Michael Myers is fucking Michael Myers. If you take away that thing that makes him special, he stops being interesting. Like, I like The Ring because it has these rules, but they're established yeah. early on in the first film. Everything that you need to know is there. Well, and The Ring also had a killer that in some way you can actually sympathize with. So it, it was playing on a different level. Right. But when you have the first film, it was kind of played as whether or not it was supernatural or he just was a super hard to kill guy. Like, he just did not feel pain, did not feel... He didn't care. Yeah. You know, I mean, obviously by the second, it gets a little silly, like when she shoots his eyes out and it gets worse from there. When again, that was meant to be an ending. Right, right. It's one of those things where I can kind of see like, okay, they slowly built up the mythology over films, but they never really explained it. I think when you go this far into it and try to explain it all in one giant info dump, maybe if this had been like an ongoing series where they could kind of have Tommy Doyle trying to investigate and only getting like small bits and pieces over time, it might work. But when you just do it as a giant info dump, it just yeah. kills the pacing. I had to like stop and go back a few pages once or twice because I just realized I was just kind of glazing over and just kind of going, uh huh, Celtic cult, uh, blah, 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 Murphy Myers, okay, curse. It's not even interesting ideas though. Like, even no. if you spread it out, I mean, it's like, okay, the whole idea that he was born at 1157 on October 31st, Halloween. And yet he wasn't alive until November 1st at 1206, the day of the day. Right. <laughs> it's like, just no. Yeah, and you think the Halloween would be like the more appropriate cursed time to be born. I don't know. I mean, I guess that is the day of the dead and blah, blah, blah. But it's just, yeah. There are parts, like I kind of like the bits with Tommy and Brackett. I kind of like some of that. It's not great. But it feels like this could have been Halloween 7 if they hadn't done H2O. I like that idea of Brack coming. I, I don't like the idea of him just killing Richie and dumping the body. Right. But I like that whole thing of Brackett coming back, which Charles Cyphers is still around and still acting, so you could. I like that idea of bringing back that tie to the past, of tying him to the backstory of the Cult of the Thorn without... He's more that he's aware of it and... Everyone in this town has taken part in it to some degree, but he's not like a devout follower or anything. He was a man who was broken by the fact that he never expected his daughter would fall into it. Right. I like that and I want to like it more, but then you get the whole thing of, oh yeah, Judith Myers was actually a nymphomaniac because her father molested her and the entire football team slept with her, including me. Yeah, was he supposed to be the guy who went up the stairs with her in that first film? Is that what the implication is? I don't think so. The very first issue that we talked about actually did replay that scene. If they were going to tie that to Lee Brackett, I think they would have done it here. Right. I don't know. I just was kind of curious because I don't remember if they said his name or not. I don't think they did. It could be him. I don't know. It just seemed like to me that would be the only reason why he would feel so hurt by her death because he became a cop because he apparently had missed Michael's killing the girl he just had abnormally fast sex with. And I'm looking at the first issue and when Judith is talking to her boyfriend, she doesn't name him. Right. And I don't remember if the film says his name at all. I'm guessing that they wouldn't have. Or if they did, you'd think people would have picked up on that a lot earlier. Okay, he does say that Judith was his ex at the time. Okay. He says, I dated her for a while before I went away to college. So he was already a college kid sleeping with a teenager. Yeah, lovely. Well, no, before he went away to college. So he well, probably yeah. was still in high school. The senior dating the freshman? Probably. It was the 60s. <laughs> we could just say that about all this. It was the 60s. It was the 70s. It was early 2000s. Whatever, you know. Yeah. I don't know. 
like I like the idea of Tommy and Brackett teaming up against Michael. I think if you expanded on this cult thing and like I said, paced it differently, you might have turned it into something interesting. Oh yeah. Have it be that Brackett is like, you know, this is something that's been going on in this town too long. It's time to bring it to an end and right. build on that character the priest to show that there's even fractions happening within the cult. Right. And I think even like bringing Richie back, even if he's just a like, scumbag, like drug dealer. I liked what they did with Richie. The other two were there just as body fodder. So you have that one page of Michael killing him. Admittedly, I didn't like the scene where they confront Tommy. It was so random. Yeah, and plus it was like, Paul Rudd, I never got gay off of him, other than he was weird, but... They're bullies, and this was the yeah. era where you call people f***ing stuff in stories and stuff. Yeah, I, I didn't care for it. Yeah. I did like Richie going back to the house and going, I ran into this monster and I managed to live. And it haunted him and, yeah, and wanting to burn it down and unfortunately getting shot by Brackett, which probably shouldn't have done that. Oh, he was stabbed by Brackett. Well, it says we see him with a knife later on, but if you look at the sound effects, it's IE, blam, blam, blam. And then they go in and you see Tommy being confronted by the bullies. And then the next scene after that is Brackett standing over the body with a knife, which does not yeah. make any sense. That strikes me as probably an editorial mistake. Like it was written as stabbing, but they wrote it blam because they thought, oh, well, the cop's going to kill the guy. Someone probably didn't put two and two together there. Right. I'm guessing those blams were added later because, yeah, that makes no sense at all. Yeah, that threw me off because I was going, wait. The art is not terrible, but some of the storytelling is not great as far as like the panel layout and whatnot. Yeah. Actually, just the coloring bothers me more than the actual art. It's too shiny yeah. and glossy. I mean, it's... It's early 2000s. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not unusual for this period, but it's not the best. But it, actually, I kind of like some of the stuff like they do with Michael, like that burnt mask. Yeah, where he's just standing there. Yeah, that's actually kind of cool. I mean, even looking at it, and it is doing these weird layouts with these kind of jagged panel edges and some pages where you're not quite sure. They, they don't flow into each other very cleanly. Yeah. It's some odd layout work. Yeah. Like I said, it's better than a lot of the stuff we've covered on Longbox. I think the actual pencil work is pretty solid, other than some of the faces get a little weird. Like, a lot of Tommy's, I just look at him going, sometimes he looks like Paul Rudd, sometimes he looks like a constipated Frank Castle. There's times where he looks more buff. Yeah. Again, yeah, there's a lack of consistency there. Like, they keep the preacher that sets Tommy and Bracket free. Like, they keep him in shadows up until the panel where he gets stabbed. I'm like, why did they do that? It served no purpose to keep him in shadows. He was, like, talking to Blankenship, I believe. Well, I'm looking at him. He's on panel. He's untying them, and then you see a close-up of his face with Michael looming over his shoulder. I don't know. It just seems, like, unnecessary to, like, add this whole new character who then just gets stabbed. And you never see him, and he never does anything other than that, other than just talk with Blankenship briefly. It's, again, that you have that characteristic of he's parting ways with Blankenship. But they don't have any room to let that breathe at all. Right. Because there's so much of the backstory. Miss Blankenship doesn't even look like Miss Blankenship. No. And then because you have to have that whole scene where Michael has to go kill some teenage trick-or-treaters to get a clean mask. And I'm even guessing that's what happens because you see the one guy holding a Michael Myers mask and suddenly Michael from then on doesn't have a burnt one. Yeah. Except then he, two pages later, he gets his face set on fire again. Yeah. Again, you could have cut out the whole thing of the other two bullies. You could have cut out the whole thing of Michael just killing the random girl in the car. And that would have given you at least two or three extra pages of story you could tell. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, this is the type of comics that I like. I'm not the hugest fan of the current comics thing where it takes you like six issues to tell one story. I kind of like every issue. Even if you're telling a broader story among several issues, each issue is still a full, complete episode unto itself. Mm -hmm. As opposed to you have to string six together in order to get an entire fleshed out story. I like denser writing. Right. I don't mind the denseness of it, but again, it's just not put together very... It's like Halloween 6. It's a lot of interesting ideas that they think are more clever than they are, but they aren't taking the time to actually build any of that into a story that would actually make those ideas interesting. Right. It almost needed to be like, maybe not like a full graphic novel, but like those little bound, thicker books that they would do, like the old Marvel graphic novel, like that type of thing where it needed a few more pages, like double size it, and then they probably could have pasted it I mean, I didn't like the cult stuff, but at least you could have told it better. Could have gotten into the characters involved more. Right, and established who the priest was rather than just him being servant of the Cult of Thorns that isn't the Cult of Thorns. Yeah. 
and have Brackett and Doyle maybe do something other than just have an info dump and then get captured. It, I don't know. It just a little bit more would have gone a long ways. You could have Miss Blankenship herself fill in some of that backstory. You know, break that up a little more. Exactly. Bracket has figured out only so much of this so far, but you need Blankenship to fill in the last little pieces. It is surprising for everything that's going on. This is still only a 22-page comic. Yeah. I think it read faster for me than what the other one was, but admittedly, I did have to go back a couple times because that info dump was just so... Like, that page where they show Michael being born, it's a solid wall of text almost. Yeah. I'm looking at it. Yeah, those four pages, whereas the other one was like a good 15 pages of Loomis narration. Right. Ugh. The art again, you know, it's very gory, violent art, but again, it doesn't feel overly done like it could. No. I have read some of those horror tie-ins that like Avatar did later, because Avatar did some Elm Street and mm-hmm. Texas Chainsaw and Friday the 13th. Those are so ridiculously over the top in violence. Yeah, and there's not like a lot of like sex or anything either, like what no. you'd expect from like a chaos comic. You get a few shots of Judith from the backstory and the uh, one shot of yeah. Michael's mom giving birth and that's about it. Yeah, nothing is exploited as what you'd expect from Chaos Comics, which admittedly this was early 2000s as opposed to the mid-90s, which was where that reached its pinnacle. I had a thought. What's that? A Michael Myers Lady Death crossover. (laughs) I don't even know how that would work, but I kind of want to see it. He sees her and they both remind him of his sister. (laughs) Oh, God. I apologize for that joke. She's literally deaf and he keeps killing everyone, so I'm sure there's some way you could string a story (laughs) out of it. So, you want to go on to the next one? Yeah, I mean, I'm just skimming through. I don't really have anything else to add. Oh, what did you think of the sudden time jump of the last two panels? Of suddenly, three months later, he's been convicted of all the murders and is in a cell. <sighs> it felt like it was there to get us to the next chapter, and that's it. I guess it's supposed to be a cliffhanger of sorts, but as opposed to, like, the last one, which kind of left things like, okay, I kind of want to see what happens next. Okay, Tommy's going to go after Jace, or go after Jace. (laughs) Tommy's going to go after Michael. Wasn't there the character in the Friday the 13th named Tommy who spent, like, four films as, like, the arch nemesis of Jason? (laughs) Yeah, I think he became, wasn't he supposed to become Jason? Wasn't that the Corey Feldman kid who then grew up and then kind of became the Loomis to Jason? I think so. They both have their Tommies. Yeah. Oh my god. A crossover comic where you're not only teaming up the killers, but you're teaming up the Tommies. (laughs) Go Team Tommy. I would admit, I've always wanted to see like the horror icons team up a little bit more than what we've gotten in the past, so I would definitely watch that. As long as it doesn't have backstory written by Daniel (laughs) Ferrans. Because then there'll be like some like archaic reason why they're both named Tommy that goes centuries into the past. Gaelic lore. According to Gaelic lore, Tommy is the name of the savior character. They tie into the Anglo-Saxons, and so it's a whole story of the Anglo-Saxons versus the Druids. And then all of a sudden the Who come in and they start playing Tommy, and no, that's a step too far. Who are you? Who, who? <laughs> okay, you're gonna have fun editing this one. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we still got one more to go. Okay, so last issue. Yes. Halloween 3, issue 1, titled The Devil's Eyes. And again, I like that. The blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a shame they never figured out something that they could do for the first one. Yeah. I think what I read in Wiki is that the original one was intended to be just a one shot, and then mm. they kind of approved doing more. So I have a feeling they didn't quite know until later on that there's going to be more than just the one. So it was just Halloween. I had no idea what we were in for. Uh, So what are we in for, Noel? So again, Nutman is the only one credited for writing this story. But if you actually look on the credits page over in the top left, they actually have based on a screenplay treatment by Philip Nutman and Daniel Ferrans. Yes. So I don't know what the backstory is behind that. They never got into it in the podcast I listened to. So I don't know if this entire storyline has been based on that and we're only seeing this credit now or if this specific issue is based on that. What is on Wikipedia? Wikipedia or the Halloween Wiki? Wikipedia. These comics were based on Daniel Ferran's concept for Halloween 8. He had been approached by the producers to pitch a follow-up to Halloween H2O, 
His idea was to have Tommy Doyle incarcerated at Smith's Groves for Michael Myers' crime, only to escape and reunite with Lindsay Wallace. And then it kind of goes into what we'll discuss in just a minute here. So I'm guessing this issue primarily is based on that draft, and then the other two issues were kind of built up over... I mean, it's possible that they had intended to do some of this, but I know obviously, like, Donald Pleasance was dead by that point, so obviously they couldn't have planned to include, unless they recast him for, like, the flashback. I don't know if the other stuff would move the story forward or not, as far as what we saw in Halloween 2, the comic. It's interesting, because Halloween and Halloween 2 are kind of one story, and this is a second story. And they build off each other, but I mean, we'll get into it. There's a year jump. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's save it for when we get into the story. But yeah, no, it's interesting that that credit only appears on this one. Right. And I could see that he started telling a story of part one, and then, then they're like, oh, hey, can we just dust off that one thing that didn't get... It could just be that they had a script that didn't get sold over the course of that year. Yeah, it's possible. And just decided, what if we kind of fold it into here? It's something I'd like to know more. Sadly, not is still around. I haven't been able to find any interviews where Ferrans talks about it. Well, when did H2O come out? H2O was 1998. Because I think Halloween 8 wasn't until 2002. Right. So by that point, they probably realized that it wasn't going to get made. Or the studio had already passed on it. Yeah. Right. So they were like, well, let's just fold this into what I'm doing here. Or at least the idea is, yeah. So anyways, penciler Justiniano was another early find by Chaos, working on some of the earliest Evil Ernie and Lady Death comics, and kept working for them on the likes of Chastity and the Omen. Starting in the late 90s, he moved to DC, where he had prominent runs on Titans, Day of Vengeance, Creeper, Countdown to Mystery, and Reign in Hell, and he hasn't worked much lately because he's in jail for child porn. Yeah, I read that. Like, the name ringed the bell. And he did have some prominence there at DC for a while. Yeah, he did some actually fairly notable stuff, and I'm pretty sure I've read some of it. And then I saw the part about the child pornography. I was like, well, yeah, fuck this guy. Fuck him. Yep. Anchor Walden Wong got his start as a freelancer in the 90s on indie books like Helena, Ninja High School, Warrior Nun, and Stargate. Keep forgetting there were Stargate comics back in the 90s that were actually tied into the movie, not the TV series. Hmm. By 1997, he started working for Marvel DC and again is one of those hugely prolific inkers with a whole myriad of titles, including the occasional indie. And one of the indie comics that he worked on as an inker, Violent Messiahs. Oh. To tie back to the last episode. One year after the events of the first two issues, we find out Tommy is locked up in Smith's Grove Sanitarium under the watchful eye of Cult of the Thorn head Dr. Wynn, who, I forget, was not actually killed on camera during the theatrical cut. Yeah, I was going to say, he's in the room when... Michael goes on the killing spree. Yeah, yeah. but we never see the on-screen kill. We just see him, like, look shocked. Yeah, so I guess you can say he got away. Which I don't mind, because I like that actor, and it would have been nice to see him again. He's prepping to remove Tommy through a faked suicide, but the younger man escapes, setting the rest of the sanitarium free, just like the one inmate's balls, as the gates are crashed. (laughs) Did you catch that in that one frame? The only nudity in this comic is the one guy's testicles as they're running. (laughs) I did not. Um, Kind of disturbed, but... Oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. Sure enough. Just hanging free. Well, you know, something for the ladies and 10% of the male audience. (laughs) On his way out, Tommy thinks he sees Michael. In Haddonfield, Lindsay Wallace, the other child of the first movie, has now grown into a journalist and is researching an article picking up where Tommy's attempts at a book left off. On the news is not only word about Tommy's escape, but word that this is set a little after the events of H2O, where the headless body of Michael was found by authorities, but neither the head nor Laurie Strode were ever discovered. So yes, I'm thinking the killer in the first two issues was Michael. And that those were set before H2O. We'll see. I'm not certain about that, but possibly. Because Tommy's been in there for over a year, and I think they're saying that this happened less than a year. Well, yeah, I think you might be right. Anyways, not to spoil things too quickly, which I'll spoil in a second. (laughs) Also, the bodies and headstones of the three teenagers from the first film have also been dug up and disappeared. Lindsay's worried this might be the work of Tommy, but he breaks into her home and does his best to fill her in on everything he knows. She also reveals she found the hidden diary of Dr. Loomis in the late Sheriff Brackett's home, but all this does is sum up backstory we already know, and the added twist of there being a third Myers child, which was already revealed in the form of Lori. See, I'm guessing this is something they kind of grafted on, because they didn't really have anything left to tell in the secret diaries of Dr. Loomis. Right. Back in the present, Tommy and Lindsay hear a noise upstairs where they find the rotten bodies and the tombstone displayed on her bed, as well as a severed and hollowed out head lit from within like a jack-o'-lantern. Michael attacks, stabbing Tommy and Lindsay flees. 
Unable to get any help, she finds herself at the Myers' home and decides to calmly walk in, going up to Judith's old bedroom and brushing her hair at the mirror of the long-dead teen. When Michael appears, Lindsay tries to talk him down, telling him both of his sisters are dead and that it's over. Michael suddenly lashes out, Lindsay burying a shard of glass in his black eye. His devil's eye. Tommy appears, shooting Michael in the back and yanking off the mask, only to reveal the killer is actually... Dun dun dun! Wait for it. The killer is Laurie Strode. <laughs> uh. Laurie and Tommy crash out of the top floor window to the ground below. Tommy dies, but we pick up four months later with Laurie sitting catatonic in a cell at Smith's Grove Sanitarium, as Lindsay asks at Dr. Block what happened. Gee, this is a scene straight from a book written by a guy named Block, isn't it? Yeah, I caught that. He theorizes that, after killing Michael, something in Lori snapped and she felt a need to fill the void in her life once filled by Michael so she became him. It's just a mental illness. For all the mythos surrounding the Myers family, it all boils down to a hereditary mental illness. Or it does it. Because as Block leaves and Lori stares out her barred window, Dr. Wynn looks in the door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what did you think of this final entry in the Halloween trilogy from Chaos? Ah, uh, do you recommend it? I'm going to say no. I am not as put off by the reveal as I thought I might be, especially when I read that this was intended to pick up from H2O. Mm -hmm. I kind of makes sense because Jamie Lee Curtis was obligated for a cameo in Halloween 8. And to be honest, this is still a better use of her than what we actually got in Halloween 8. I'm really conflicted on it, though. It seems kind of disrespectful to the character of Lori, and it just feels weird seeing that one panel of her, like, with the empty eye socket, the other eye, like, rolling in the back of her head, and yeah, that's supposed to be Jamie Lee Curtis. This is where the art definitely captures the likeness. And that's the one where, like, that just feels wrong, and no, I didn't like it. I liked parts of it. I liked seeing Lindsay. I liked seeing her again. I liked that everyone who Michael Myers has ever encountered is somewhat haunted by it and doesn't come out clean. And so that she's become this obsessed writer in a different way than what Tommy has, but still not quite doing as well as what she probably would have been if she had never encountered him. But there's really not enough story here is the big problem more than anything. It's the reveal. That's basically what this whole issue comes to is whether or not you like the reveal or not. And I'm okay with the reveal to a degree, but it's not enough for me. So I'm going to have to say give it a pass. And I recommend it. Okay. Not like hugely recommend it, but at least this one I thought kind of worked for me. In that I like how so much of it does echo that first film with finding out that a tombstone's been dug up, finding the friends splayed out on the bed upstairs, even the whole thing where Lori and Tommy go out the window, you know, and she still mm -hmm. survives it at the end. The whole Lori being the new killer. In some ways, it feels like wasted potential of other things you could do with that character, because you could so easily just have Lori be the new Loomis, even better than Tommy could have ever been. Right. What helps this is seeing just how much they wasted that potential in Part 8. Yeah, you know, and I was right on the borderline. So when you asked me, I was honestly not sure which way I was going to go with this one. I think ultimately I still stand by that. But having seen Part 8 just yesterday, and like I said... That film can go die in a fire. It's one of those things where they've been trying to do this since part four. Right. Like, they're trying to find a new Michael because Michael was never intended to be the supernatural boogeyman, like, Terminator that he became. Yeah. And so I think that they kept going, well, we got to set up, like, a backup because people are not going to keep buying that he can keep getting up. And nothing ever stuck. And admittedly, I don't know that the story of Jamie Strode, especially when she was, like, eight years old or something, when we saw her attack her mom, would have been exactly compelling. But it's something that they've been trying to do ever since then. And as we said in part five, it would be neat to see her as like the protege of Michael. Right. I mean, they did it with Danny in part six, and they kept trying to set up there's going to be a protege, and they just never quite managed to pull it off. And so I think Lori makes the most sense. It also has that kind of bitterness of you rejected this, well, we're still going to put it out there. Right. 
And I guess it's technically an echo of what we see in Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Which I still haven't seen yet. I haven't either, and I really have zero desire to. I'm going to have to soon. The idea is that she became seduced by Michael. So it kind of works in multiple levels that way, but... No, it doesn't. (laughs) Yeah. No, but I'm saying that it's something that clearly a lot of people keep having this inclination that Michael can, you know, and admittedly, it's a mask. It makes sense that you could pass that along to somebody else and somebody could pick it up and wear it. I just don't know, like, why Lori would do that. Well, let me get into it for a sec. Okay. One of the things that I brought up is that it's not so much that anyone should ever replace Michael, but it's interesting to have a character who is lured into having the potential to become what Michael is. And I thought that's what could have made the Jamie story interesting. It's not that she becomes the new Michael, but that she starts to get pulled in that direction. It becomes this conflict of trying to pull her away from that to prevent her from becoming the new Michael. And that creates some interesting stuff with Loomis, which wasn't helped by part five. Yeah. Yeah. There totally is a reason why they would not have bought this story for the movie. And that's because, and you you haven't heard our H2 episode because I haven't cut it and released it yet, but this episode will be coming up after our H2 episode. The opening of Halloween 8 was something that Kevin Williamson had to come up with in order to sell the ending of Halloween 7. Mm. They were contractually obligated to not ever kill Michael Myers. So he had to come up with a way to get out of killing Michael Myers in order to make it look like he killed Michael Myers. So the start of Halloween 8 does not fit with what we actually see in Halloween 7. And he came up with that so that he could let Halloween 7 be an ending. So that he knew they were going to make more movies. He knew they were going to make more Halloween movies. But if you wanted Halloween 7 to be your ending, it could be. Mm. And that was why he was so willing to give them the shitty opening of Halloween 8. Because he wanted to do as good of an ending as he could for Halloween 7. Hmm. Well, I don't know. And spoilers, Alex and I loved Halloween 7. Oh, it's easily the second best in the series. But all these films, they keep wanting to go back to the motif of somebody replacing Michael. And whether or not like it was intended Jamie would ever have worn the mask, it does make sense that somebody else could pick up the mask and become... Like, originally, he was just referred to as the shape in the credits. It doesn't even have to be Michael Myers. But I think that the way they did it in this just doesn't quite work for me. Right. As interesting of an idea as this is, it would still ruin Halloween 7. Mm -hmm. Especially with the way that Laurie never gets to be a character. No. She's a twist, and then we just see her go into that glass-eyed catatonic state. Right. We never hear from her. We never talk to her. We never get anything from her. We never get to build how she became this. We never get any of that. I still don't ultimately think it works, but I think as a little cheap tie-in alternative to Halloween 8, I'll take it. Yeah. Not that I want this to be the canon. For my personal headcanon, Halloween 7 is where it ends. Yeah. I'll still give other ones a chance, but my personal headcanon is Halloween 7 is the ending. But if you're going to go beyond it, I like this better than Halloween 8. I Well, yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Even though this is not really in itself an ending, this is set up for the next chapter. This is playing right. out like the first chapter, and then the next story would be exploring into Lori more. The biggest thing is that it's trying to take what was probably like a 90-page script and condense it into 22 pages of comics. Right. It's, again, a lot of word balloons that fill up pages. There's not a whole lot that happens. You know, I, I don't entirely agree with that. Go on. Well, because at least this one, we have a couple of early pages, especially the one where it's Lindsay just kind of narrating her backstory and what all she's mm-hmm. been up to, which I love bringing in Lindsay, and I thought this was a great way to do it. Oh, yeah. Especially better than the quote-unquote Lindsay of Part 4. And then the news story recounting what happened post-H2O. But a lot of it is actually the story is moving. And again, you know, that's where it was kind of disappointing that they brought up the secret diary of Dr. Loomis and then there's really nothing in it. Yeah. They just kind of move away from it really quick. Yeah, I get the feeling that probably would have played a bigger part in the screenplay, I'm going to guess, if it was there at all. We probably would have gotten some of the stuff that we had in the last two issues come up during it. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if Sheriff Brackett was supposed to be a part of this story. Maybe. I couldn't really find a way to cleanly put him in, but it'd be interesting. Grant, you don't need all that backstory because it's ultimately not about Michael. No. It's about recreating a ghost of the first movie, you know, with digging up the Mm. headstone and the teenagers. And I even like that it gets to a point where Lindsay just knows that she can't outrun Michael. She can't fight Michael, but she can at least try to psych him out a bit, you know, with the whole echoing Judith. Mm -hmm. 
and also kind of replaying that scene from Halloween. I think it was Halloween five between Jamie and Michael, where she's just kind of reaching for his hand and he's just kind of like locked in and then suddenly lashes out again. Yeah, I kind of like the idea that it's one of those things that they should have addressed in Halloween eight. But at this point, I guess there was still technically Laurie's son, but Mm -hmm. we don't know what happens to him, apparently. I do like the idea that, like, Michael, his crowning moment was kind of stolen from him. So, therefore, like, why are you doing this? You're not going to accomplish anything. And I think it could have been played out better, but I do like that's her way of trying to go, like, hey, look, there's no purpose to this anymore. They're all dead. You killed them all. And even the whole your sisters are both dead is with the revelation that this is actually Lori. You can see that that would be something that would even just cause Lori to, in whatever state her mind is in, would just cause a moment of pause, you know? Right. There's just a lot of things I just, it doesn't quite click for me, but like Tommy. (laughs) With his new shaved head and goatee. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I guess they got away from Paul Rudd finally, but his purpose here is just to seem to be to die nobly, I guess. Like it's really Lindsay's story, which fine, I'm, I'm okay with that, but I don't know if we really need the Tommy character then. Other than he just serves as the final part of what we've established over the two previous issues. What you would benefit from having this spaced out in the movie is with Tommy escaping from an asylum, you get to play up more. Is he the one doing the killings? Can Lindsay trust him? Is he really the one who's secretly doing all this stuff? And even though you can start building up the conflicts of how he's kind of going through an echo of what Michael went through, too, in terms of escaping and how is that affecting him? And I also like that he could also be kind of a faux protagonist because he's someone we followed in the past, especially here in the comic. And yet now he's kind of passing the torture protagonist to Lindsay. I like it when stories do that, where they make you think you know who the lead character is and then it shifts. But I mean, granted, from this one, from the moment you get the one page of Lindsay, you know she's going to be the main focus. Right. So I didn't dislike it, but I do think that he didn't get much to do. Other than the fact that Dr. Wynn is here, they completely move away from... Well, you get with Dr. Wynn and you get that one backstory of the old lady talking to Loomis. But none of the story of this issue has anything to do with the Cult of the Thorn or that whole elaborate backstory. They're even kind of suggesting that that's all kind of meaningless now because Michael is dead. Right. And Lori, her killing is not tied to this curse. It's just she's cracked. Yeah. And it really does make me think that this was probably like most of what they took from the screenplay was this single issue and everything else was just kind of bled in. Yeah. Yeah. It was stuff that they maybe had ideas for and then the movie was never going to get made. So they just said, like, let's turn it into this last issue. And again, they could never make the story because the way the contracts were, you cannot have Michael be dead. So this story would be completely impossible to do in the movies. Just do the politics of the contracts. Well, I mean, those can get negotiated if they needed to. If they came up with something that would really, like, blow everyone away. Yeah, this wouldn't. Yeah, no. This, no. Especially after taking the big gamble that they did with H2O. I don't think they would then take a further gamble on top of that. No. I mean, H2O did kind of breathe some new life into the franchise. By ending it. (laughs) Yeah. But like you said, they had worked out a way so that way they could bring it back. Even if it was something that was Kevin Williamson writing some notes on the side of the script saying something, something paramedic. (laughs) Here you go. Here you go. Oh, it was literally something that he literally had to throw together at the last minute because he thought he could sell the idea of let's kill Michael and then found out that no, it's not that the producers don't agree with you. It's they will not kill their one franchise that their entire career and company are hinged on. The Akkads? Yeah. Okay. They will not let him die because they need to keep making the movies because that's what their entire company's built on. They've only made 10. Yeah, but they do successfully enough that they have a little time in between. Yeah, it's been a while. And I guess I have heard some rumors of new films coming out, so maybe it'll happen. Oh, that's a whole thing I can tell you about off the recording. We get into that on H202 with the whole right slaps. So what do you think of the art on this one? Not that we want to talk about the artist. Well, that's what makes what he did in his life such a waste, is that he is a genuinely talented artist. That's what I thought so, too. My problem is the faces are sometimes a little overly pinched and feel weirdly small. Yeah. But I think, yeah, his layouts, there's some beautiful... I mean, like, the whole Loomis interviewing the old lady, and you have that one panel where it's the backstory amidst her smoke rising from the cigarette she's smoking. Mm -hmm. You can see how this early stuff would lead to him becoming successful, especially in the big two. Yeah. 
like there's some really like great panels like the scene with the corpses laid out in the bed is just effective it's creepy it's kind of gross but not overly you know and the action has a lot of movement the faces are expressive i don't quite get why michael looks like he literally has black glass for his eyes yeah as opposed to just being like a hole or there being eyes in there but it's moody there's some striking imagery at times you know the thing is when a horrible person I don't like ignoring that horrible people can still do talented things. I like holding up the fact that their talent makes it so much of a waste that they're horrible people. And Justiniano, I'm not going to ignore the fact his art is fantastic. Yeah. But that he wastes it by having done the things that he did in his life. Right, exactly. And that's pretty much sums up how I feel is I do think that sometimes I can separate the artist from the work. Not with child porn. Yeah, yeah. that's one that I'm kind of just like, e- I can't seriously, like I said, fuck this guy. To a degree, you can look at the art, not the artist. But the question is, are you still supporting the art or the artist? And are they still continuing to show behaviors that they did? And how far is too far and all that stuff? Right. I mean, I've seen some people, and like you said, I'm not going to specifics, who have done things or said things that I feel are inappropriate, and they've later recanted and say, look, I'm sorry, I was not, you know, whatever. And they're not excusing their actions. They're saying, look, I made a mistake. But again, you know, something like child porn is something that's automatic. There's no wiggle room around that. What was his quote? When he was sentenced to 10 years, suspended after he served three years in prison, followed by a 10-year probation after he pleaded guilty to second-degree possession of child pornography, when asked if he had anything to add he replied i think i'm good yeah now admittedly there's some leeway as to how that could be interpreted as what he thinks i think i'm good means but there's no way i can read that and think yeah this is a guy who feels bad about what he's done fuck this guy yeah and again it's just such a waste because i would absolutely say this was the best drawn of the three issues i agree i even say that as someone who actually liked the art in the last two issues but i mean those still had a kind of rough around the edges indie feel to it you can see right. why this guy very quickly jumped to the pros. Right. Like, I've read The Young Justice, 80 Page Giant. I'm pretty sure I read some of the Titan stuff he's done. And yeah, there's a lot of this stuff. The Days of Vengeance was a miniseries that was a pretty big miniseries yeah. at the time. But yeah, he's kind of a scummy guy. And unfortunately, I'm kind of glad he's never probably going to get any more comics work. And I'm hoping he doesn't. Yeah. I'm sure neither of the big two will ever hire. Probably not, no. It's a PR disaster if they did that. But I wouldn't be surprised if someone gave him some indie work. Yeah. Maybe he'll go back to Brian Pulido's avatar. (laughs) (laughs) So, any final thoughts on the comic? I'm kind of glad I finally read it because I know I owned the first issue for a long time and I did read it, but I never fully got into it because I had never seen the producer's cut. I never knew all this lore and backstory and just Mm -hmm. even behind the scenes stuff that tied into it. This trilogy overall has been an interesting experience. It's an interesting look at people trying desperately to keep making Halloween 6 relevant. (laughs) Yeah. Well, when you have one of the writers involved, it's kind of natural. Because, I mean, the thing about Halloween 6 is that Daniel Franz was still very proud of his script and the whole backstory he did, even though he didn't like either cut of the movie entirely. But he shouldn't have been because that original script sucked. (laughs) It's where writers just won't let go of the fact that they were probably the weaker link in something and not the other person. Hmm. Kevin Williamson never really took any of the credit he should have gotten for H2O because he was kind of embarrassed of the deal that he had to make for the opening of Halloween 8. That's kind of why he took his writing credits off. Mm. A writer who's aware of their limitations is a writer that I respect. A writer who just keeps barreling forward thinking that they're God's gift to writing, and they keep just turning out nonsensical backstory convolutions. I get the impression that it was Nutman who wrote mo- I mean, this is obviously based on a script that he and Ferran said. Well, I'm not talking about this third issue. I'm just talking about those first two, where it was all the backstory, where they're yeah. just trying to make the cult and supernatural angle and curses work. And it's just like, let it go. Just let it go. I'd bring back Tommy. That's cool. Let go yeah. of the cult of the thorn. Bring back Lindsay. But yeah, it's right there on the bloody edge of recommend and not recommend as a yeah. whole for me. There are parts of it that I think are really cool and some really interesting ideas. Like you said, I don't think I would want this to be the canon ending for the franchise going forward, but... For a tie-in alternative. Yeah, it would, a universe where Laurie Strode takes Michael Myers' place could be interesting, you know. Unfortunately, all it does is set up that. A story that we never get, yeah. Yeah, and I have a feeling that they probably intended to go back to it later on, especially maybe once Halloween Resurrection came out, they realized that maybe the studio or, well, by that point, Chaos was defunct anyways. And the license would have gone somewhere else. Right. 
we never got our Tommy Doyle Buster Rhymes team up. <sighs> See, I would kind of want to see that. There is a part of me that wants to visit that universe where Tommy shows up and we're one of the few people who survived an attack from Michael Myers. Let's team up and stop him for realsies. Oh, I had, back in the day, an entire fanfic in my head. This was before Hack Slash, but it basically be like the Hack Slash thing where all the previous victims decide we're going to go hunt Michael down and their operation is financed by the Buster Rhymes character. <laughs> it was going to be the Josh Hart in it. It was going to be Tommy and all the other characters from Part 6. Anyone who survived a Halloween movie, we're all going to team up because they know they themselves are the bait for Michael. Right. So he's going to come to them at some point in their lives. So what if we just bring the fight to him? One of the things I really did like about this comic, especially like in the second issue where everyone who's ever been touched by Michael Myers in their life is broken by it. Is broken by it. Or scarred by it. Yeah. They don't come out the same. I think that's a really awesome touch, but obviously they don't really explore that too much except for like maybe Lindsay or to a degree Tommy. But yeah, it's one of those things that I like the idea. Unfortunately, I don't think it's been executed as well as it could be. I don't think Philip Nutman is a bad writer. In fact, I would be actually curious to read his novel Wetworks. Mm -hmm. But I also don't think he's a particularly great writer. Some of the ideas are great. Some of the ideas are bad. He's not the best at kind of sorting them out. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he's working for probably not the best company. I mean, like even just editorially, there's errors, there's typos, there's the whole blam, blam, blam when someone's getting stabbed. Yeah. I just think it's a situation where this is kind of as good as it was going to get. But again, there's some good art in there. There's some good ideas in there. There are some very effective sequences in there. For a tie-in comic, I'm perfectly fine with it. And again, it's not something that people have to, but if you're a Halloween fan and you're just kind of curious, I'd say, yeah, check it out. Yeah. I'm right there on the tip of the butcher's knife, so to speak. It's which way I want to lean towards. I think I'm going to probably lean towards a not recommend, but you could do a lot worse. And actually, there are enough interesting ideas and some fairly decent art here that I think you could, if you're a big Halloween fan, I think you can find it at least an intellectually stimulating exercise, especially like the last issue where you're just going to go, oh, what would that play out as? And admittedly, I don't think it does the greatest job of showing that, but I think as a idea, I think it presents an interesting concept that I think had they gone on could have provided some potentially interesting stories. Just maybe with a better writer. This is where we kind of go back to that Adventures of Snake Plissken thing of, I would have been curious to see what the next issue would have been. And I kind of feel that way with this. Maybe not recommend, but definitely would have been curious enough that I would have bought issue four if they had come out with that. I don't know if there was a trade of these, but I do also kind of feel bad that they're out of print. Like most tie-in media, they've kind of fallen between the cracks. Right. Especially with a defunct comic company, you know. Yeah. I mean, used copies of these actually do run for a little bit. That's why I'm kind of glad I was able to find them the way I found them. Perfectly legitimate methods. Yes. And nothing else. Nothing else. But yeah, it, I'm kind of glad they exist, even though they're not that good. Yeah. That brings us to a close on the chaos comics of Halloween, but we still got like at least two more episodes of Halloween comics to explore. Two more episodes of Halloween, Halloween, Halloween. Halloween. So what's next? Not chaos comics. <laughs> <laughs> next, we got a few kind of little weird indie titles, but they set up a writer who will then continue writing Halloween leading into, uh, I think it's Devil's Due Publishing, picked up the license and had mm. it for like a year or so. We'll have this kind of broader run of books that are all written by this one guy to the point where we're going to break them in half. We'll see the Stephen Hutchinson continuity of Halloween, which I've never read any of. I've read a little bit of it because I was a little confused as to what we were covering tonight. Because we communicate. <laughs> we're professionals here, people. Yes. Crack ship. I think there's going to be some interesting conversation, but we'll get into that next time. As always, whenever you get past the first Halloween, regardless of if it's good or bad, there's going to be things to say. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that wraps up our episode. Good night, everybody. Good night. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Wow, I wrote eight pages of text. Oh, really?
my notes are pretty minimalistic, so I keep trying to picture Paul and we're not doing these scenes and my brain goes, nope. <laughs> That's like half of my notes on issue two. Well, that line's going in the outtakes. <laughs>